So I have been notified that the chat is not working just yet. Um, so I am going to um, fix that. But in the meantime, I'm just going to introduce uh, Don so he can get his presentation going. Um, so welcome to the Better Building Speaker Series. I'm Claire Morley. I'm an Energy Efficiency Officer. Uh, the Better Building Speaker Series is a webinar that we put on um, and we invite speakers who work in the housing sector um, and have a focus on all things energy or energy efficiency um, to join us and talk about um, different topics just to kind of spread the, the word and the culture um, that we're trying to build um, of, of making buildings more sustainable and, and, and therefore making our communities more resilient. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll let Don Roscoe introduce himself and Don, uh, then you can start uh, sharing your screen and, and your PowerPoint uh, presentation if that works. Okay, um, my name is Don Roscoe. Um, for the past 47 years, I have helped people design and build their homes. Um, my background is, I started off with the first two years of engineering, um, and it became more about the mathematics than it did about the visual um, um, artwork, if you like. And I didn't want to leave St. Mary's without a degree. So I tacked on a organic chemistry, which is very visually oriented, arrangement of carbon and oxygen and hydrogens, and a philosophy aesthetics course and got myself a science degree. I then applied for the College of Art and Design, enough science, enough mathematics, and enough engineering to do something creative, but I was gonna to have to wait a year to get in. And I ended up at the School of Architecture where I graduated with a degree in architecture. And my thesis at the School of Architecture was self bills. At the time, I had four people that I was helping design and build their homes. So when I graduated, I was on my way to where I am now. So tonight, we're going to look at um, my experience over the years with helping people in design and build their homes. And we'll start off with um, the co-op housing program. So um, I looked into the co-op housing program because the people that I was working with at the school of when I was at the School of Architecture all got mortgages through the uh, Nova Scotia uh, co-op housing program. There we go. All right, so a bit of the history on this. In the 1930s, there was a lot of self-help, low-income co-ops emerging. A lot of them were an extension of the St. Francis Xavier uh, programs, where they were reaching out to farmers, fishermen, miners, et cetera, and trying to create co-ops amongst them where they could get, the co-op itself could get the funding to build the houses. And the idea was that they had to come up with $500 to get into the program, of course, none of them could afford that, but they could come up with $100 and agreed to put in $400 worth of sweat equity. So that was the initial co-op housing programs, which were sweat, uh, sweat equity programs and thus the birth of the small building co-ops with pooled mortgages. So uh, you got your mortgage through the co-op and when it was paid off, 
the rights to your land, to your home and your property uh, reverted back to you. And so that's going back to 1939 through to 1973. Um, there were some changes made at that point in time. And what they discovered was that the average public housing projects ended up requiring massive subsidization, while on the other hand, the self-help co-ops end up costing the public nothing. At the same time, lending institutions were unwilling to finance owner labor um, mortgages. An example of Sun Life Insurance wouldn't give mortgages for self-bills among its own employees. So in 1975, when I graduated, uh, four of my clients were able to get a individual mortgage through the Housing Commission. And that got us underway. Well, it used to be that you could get mortgages through the banks and the mortgage companies um, if you had the financials to get there. Um, and now that's changed over the years. Um, and things have evolved to the point where um, my clients have a hard time going to the mortgage company and getting a mortgage on the basis of self-bills. And that means that I have to be the contractor. Um, and that's despite the fact that every house we do is done with an engineer stamp on it because of some of the technology that we'll use and we'll get into that a little later on. Um, and also um, the fact that, that I am, um, I have a degree in architecture, um, but I'm not an architect. Um, and every house that we do is done under the entrance guide program, which means it's blow door tested, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to say that the last house that we did uh, which was two years ago, I found out subsequently that it met the, the, uh, the proposed requirements for the building code in 2030. So the houses we were building were 10 years ahead of the building code. So let's take a look and see um, where things were at that time and how things have evolved since 1975. Okay. There was a number of ways that you could get your house built. Um, in the cove where I lived, uh, they built as they could afford it and it took years. Um, the land was in the family and it got subdivided, sub, you know, sequentially. The next generation ended up with a lot. So they ended up with a lot. And if they had a certain amount of resources, they were able to put a disposal field and a well on that lot. And there was a mobile home that made the rounds, basically, and they moved it onto the site where the house wasn't, and they moved in. And over the next God knows how many years, they would build a house and move in. So that's one approach. The other approach is to build it step by step, which is what they were doing. Um, and a lot of people moved in and finished it as they were still living in the building. And the other approach is if you need to expand, you can add on in stages. Um, so different approaches to trying to do that. So let's talk about my history working with self bills and the learning curve that's involved with all of that. 
Now, it took a while before I got the experience that I needed. And a lot of the clients, uh, some of them were not that happy with it. But some of them said, look, if you walk away from that experience, it's of no value to anybody. But if you take that experience and carry on, eventually uh, you'll do some good with it. And that's exactly what I've done. So over the years, we have um, evolved a whole lot of technology and different ways of doing things. Houses got more complicated. Um, and it wasn't that the average person could build them anymore. So it wasn't just myself anymore. It was a crew. Um, and the crews and I were always experimenting and always trying out new things to see how they would work. Um, and we've evolved some pretty good technology, which you'll see a little later on. Um, so that brings us to where we are now. So here we are, the, the maze that you have to go through these days to get a house built. Um, like I already mentioned, at this point in time, the banks are very reluctant to give mortgages to self-bills. So you actually need a insured and certified contractor uh, in most cases before they'll give you a mortgage. And that means every time I do a home, everything I own is on the line because I have to be the general contractor. Uh, so that's the beginning of it. Uh, then we've got to get a building permit. And it used to be if I was in HRM, I would take my plans in and sit down at a desk with Kim and we'd go through them pretty quickly. And if there was anything missing in the plans, I could put the notes right on the plans. And a week later, I would have a building permit. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. You'd be lucky if you got a building permit in a month these days, and you can't. You has to be. You have to submit it um, online. And the software they're using um, doesn't recognize foot and inches, so the key dimensions have to be in metric which nobody uses for building actually these days. Uh, you also have to check your planning regulations and zoning and your setbacks and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and eventually end up with a building permit. And you've got a whole series of inspections that have to be gone through and certification. So your HVAC system has to be certified. Um, and you go through the whole arrangement at that, at that point. Okay. Um, when I was teaching a course and I taught an 18 hour course on home design. Um, and um, it was three hours a night, one night a week for six weeks. And the last night of that course was called making it happen. And a big part of that is costing. So we're gonna look at some costing sheets here. Um, and so the first thing you do is you go, you look at all of the different materials and you come up with a cost on it. And I have to tell you, having done that in the last uh, couple of months, it's pretty scary when you see the difference between what it used to cost and what it does now. <laughs> and then you come up with, um, the square footage is you take the quantities off on your building on the left, you can see uh, how much slab, uh, how much frame floors, foundation walls, exterior walls, roof, interior walls, patio doors, entry doors, um, patio doors, garage doors, windows, skylights, etc. And you can see at that date, at that time, uh, originally, uh, that was 48,000 in 2001. By the time we got 2006, it was now 69,000. By the time we got to 2010, it was $77,000. Uh, 
And so we go to the other side and we can start seeing uh, all the other things that are coming in, the surveyor, uh, the excavation, gravel drive, backfield well, foundation plant, uh, forms, slab place and finish, and all of these things that have to be done. Um, we have our structural costs, which we already looked at, which is the building itself, a labor budget, and then the subs, plumbing and heating, labor and materials, electrical, rough in, telephone security, paint interior, stain exterior, gutters. And these days, uh, you're also looking at heat pump, probably mini, mini split. Um, and you're also looking at potential putting photovoltaics, hopefully not on your house, put them in the landscaping if you can. And they all end up to about 192,000 bucks. And by the time you get to the finishing work inside, which are stairs, interior doors, closet doors, finished trim, balustrades, et cetera, et cetera, flooring, walls. And in this case, we're looking at an active solar domestic hot water system in those days and cabinetry. And you can see in 2010, that house now is $235,000. Now we come to 2016, um, and it is now $300,000. And I can tell you in 2023, it's going to be significantly more than $350,000. So that's where we are costing wise these days. Now you can control costs by changing your requirements. Do you really need certain things? Your design, um, try to simplify it or whatever. Your materials, which is not a good idea. You don't want to uh, change a superior performing material with a less performing material. And you can change how you build. Um, and this is where self-build comes in because uh, if my clients have older teenage sons and daughters that have the summer off, they become part of the crew. They work with us. If you're a school teacher or have a job where you have time off in the summer or even not in the summer, um, you can participate in, in a design and construction of your home to whatever extent you want to. And if you're retirees, we put, have work, but they put on work belts, they'll rake gravel and work, work with us. So the idea is that to whatever extent the client can participate in the construction process, then we have a knowledgeable crew who will organize them, make sure they're safe, and they can participate in the design and the building of their home. So it's a different process. And we'll take put aside time at different stages to celebrate where we're at. Most clients can't read a set of plans. They can't visualize from them. But as the building's going up, we'll actually put design decisions later in the process as the client gets a feel for the building. And we'll make certain design decisions as the building is going up. Um, we would only change something if it's only going to make it better. So here's what we've learned. And I'm going to go through some of the software, um, some of the, the technology that my crews and I have uh, developed over the years. And the most important of these is phosphor using ground insulation instead of frost walls. So here we have on the left, you have a frost wall and you want to be more than three feet below grade. Um, and you want to be below the frost line. So what creates the frost line? Heat is evolving from the core of the earth for billions of years. Um, and at some point, the rate at which it, uh, in which it escapes at the surface and is replaced from below um, you can't replace it fast enough, 
and the ground will start to cool at the surface and get cooler and cooler and cooler until it gets to the point where the insulation value that's sitting above the frost line is slowing the heat flow to the point that the ground will not freeze. And if you look at the insulation value of ground, most ground, you'll find that that's about an R10 or less that's sitting on top of the frost line, slowing down the heat to the surface. So you have options here. You can dig down four feet or more, a trench for your footings, and you're gonna pull all that soil out of there and you gotta find a place to put it so it's not in your way. That's a lot of earth you're moving. And then you gotta put formwork in for the footing itself. And then you gotta pour concrete in the footing. Well, if it's a small house, that's not a lot of concrete. So you're gonna be paying more for an undersized load when the concrete truck shows up. And if there's a lot of footing and there's a lot of soil and stuff in the way, you probably have to get a pumper if you can't shoot it into the form. And that's another $700 for the pumper. Then you have to take the formwork off the footing and you gotta put forms in for the concrete wall and you end up pouring a four foot high concrete wall. And again, you gotta get a pumper in if you can't shoot it, uh, which is another 700 bucks. And when all is said and done, you gotta waterproof it. But what you don't waterproof is the footing. The bottom of the footing is sitting on down, pressing down on the soil moist soil. So you have moisture migrating into the concrete footing and into the concrete wall from the ground underneath it. And most builders don't even wait for the concrete to dry before they waterproof it. I know the guy I use for waterproofing complains all the time that he's been asked to put uh, waterproofing on top of a concrete wall. It's still not cured. And then you've got to backfill it. That's a lot of work. And that's a lot of concrete. And concrete is one of the less environmental friendly uh, products you can use. It takes a lot of energy to create concrete. And there's not very many things that replace concrete. I had an electrician. And the electrician, we sat down for lunch one day and he said, Don, uh, my cottage frost heaves every winter. What can I do about it? And I said, well, you can dig down six inches and you can get some two inch extruded styrene and you can put it around the, the uh, post and backfill it. And that'll trap the heat coming out of the earth. And he was surprised, but it worked. It never did move. So we decided we would do some experimentation ourselves. We were on a clay site later in the winter and the frost line was there. And we had a couple bundles of styrofoam sitting there on top. So we lifted the styrofoam and we dug down to see what the angle of the frost line was underneath the styrofoam. And it was roughly um, a 60 degrees, something like that. So at some point we came up with the idea, we were doing a lot of greenhouse additions onto houses basically. And we decided we would experiment with some greenhouses in case there was an issue with this. Um, and we actually um, realized, and I did some homework on this. Uh, the Swedes had put ground insulation in their building codes in the middle uh, 1960s. Uh, the research that they used was actually Canadian research. They expanded on it. Um, and the Canadian research was done during the Second World War and was used by the Americans to uh, build the Alaskan Highway. So basically what they were doing was um, they would uh, insulate the ground to keep it freezing so that the heat from under the earth couldn't get at the ground above it. 
um, so that the ground would stay, so would stay solid to support the bridge structures, et cetera, et cetera. And now with climate change, uh, they're now having to uh, use refrigerant to free, keep the ground frozen so that they'll support the building so they don't disappear into the ground. So here we are, we did some experimentation and we found that using two inches of SM, two inches away from the building was adequate to protect the building. And we since have done, oh, probably 110, something like that, structures using ground insulation techniques. So what we do basically is we'll excavate with a grade and then we'll level clear gravel, clear stone as a drainage plane for water and grade on gas. And we'll uh, compact it and we'll styrofoam the surface and we'll put this, the plumbing uh, that needs to be in, in the gravel underneath it and bring it up through and seal everything up. Um, and we have a completely um, gas tight, water tight slab on the underneath and the concrete never touches the ground anywhere. So that's what we've been using um, since the mid 1980s. Um, you need an engineer stamp to do this now. Um, um, and I looked at it and realized I took the worst freezing index in Nova Scotia, which is the Cumberland Shore facing PEI. I thought it would be Cape Red, but it wasn't. Um, and I did the calculations uh, from our experience and realized that we could have a single detail in Nova Scotia that we could use from one end of the province to the other that was pre-approved. And we would be replacing all of these frost walls with something that works a whole lot better and it's a whole lot cheaper. Um, and because we were doing greenhouses, we'll get to that shortly, um, we put air ducts in our slabs for distributing heat into the concrete. Um, so we thicken up the slab and a reinforced thickened slab is gonna more evenly distribute the weight of the building than the frost wall with. And if you take a two-story building, wood frame building and sit it on top of a four foot frost wall or especially an eight foot frost wall, you'll find out that most of the weight that's bearing on that footing is not the, the wooden framing above, it's the weight of the concrete wall itself. So um, in any event, um, this is where we're at. We've done over a hundred of these buildings, greenhouses, et cetera, and it works really well. I try to earth firm everything that we do, uh, even if it's only a couple of feet, um, because basically you're now losing heat to ground temperature, not to air temperature, and it keeps the building a lot cooler in the summer. Um, yes, and you're not exposed. So that's uh, part of what we do. I try to earth firm everything we can. Um, how many level lots are there in Nova Scotia? It's a rarity. You always got some slope um, and uh, we'll work with that slope and hopefully it's not a north facing steep slope, which means you don't have access to the sun. So from doing greenhouses, um, we ended up developing air recirculated heat storage slabs. So let's see what that's all about. When the sun's out and pouring into the greenhouse, very little of it actually hits a heat absorbing material. So if it hits the back, if it gets through the plants and it hits the back wall of the house, it hits drywall. What's on drywall? Drywall has paper on two faces of it. Now, how much heat is going to migrate into that drywall? 
Well, if you go to Tim Hortons and get a cup of nice steaming hot coffee, it's in a paper cup and it tells you how easily the heat will transfer into that gypsum. Not very well. So you can use cement board if you like. Uh, that would be much better. But still, when, when the air, those surfaces inside the greenhouses are heated, that hot air is going to rise and it's going to sit on the ceiling. And uh, that means you're going to have all the hot air on the ceiling. On a cold winter's night, cool air falls. And so you're going to have cooling air off the, safe, the inside surface of the glass that's given up its heat and it's now downdrafting over your plants and it's all going to end up on the floor. So we end up with temperature stratification in your home or in your greenhouse. With all the hot air, the hotter air is sitting up on the ceiling, increasing your rate of heat flow through the roof insulation while your feet are standing on a cold floor, the coldest surface in the house. Not a good idea. So we did some experimentation with the greenhouses. And what we did was we basically um, put a duck fan in and we plasticated the front of the growing benches. And we ran, uh, we pulled the hot air off the ceiling and we blew it in underneath the growing benches thinking we would put heat into the plant and the soils in the greenhouse, only to realize we were actually putting heat into the concrete wall in the concrete floor. And then we came up with the idea for the air recirculated heat storage slab, um, where we radiate the ductwork to, to the perimeter of the building and redistribute the heat through. And what happens is you run a fan and the fan saves you energy because it starts uh, eliminating the temperature stratification. And because humidity depends on air temperature, the hotter air on the ceiling is going to have a whole lot more moisture in it than the air that's near the floor. Um, so not only are you redistributing the heat, you're also more evenly distributing the moisture throughout the whole air mass inside your home. So there's a lot of good reasons for putting in an air recirculating uh, fan into a heat storage slab. It used to cost us, oh, probably 300 bucks a day, a year to run that recirculating fan. Um, and now it costs us closer to $60 a year because New Air in Windsor makes a fan specifically for our houses. And we can vary the airflow rate for any size building. Uh, so it's a locally made product and it will improve the efficiencies of your home. So if you got the concrete, you can use it for heat storage. And so this is what it looks like by code you now have to have air in and out of every living space. Um, and so that where we used to do just the main portion, the main living part of the house, we now have to do it with every room in the house. So that's a lot of the duct work that has to go into a house these days. Um, um, and you can see how it works. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and like I said, you now have, uh, you're not standing on a cold floor anymore. The floor is a lot warmer than it would have been otherwise. Another pet peeve um, is we used to do post and beam houses. So you would have a beam running every three feet or so across the ceiling. Um, and we would have rough sawn posts. And at some point, because of all the stuff that's put into the floor above you, uh, we had to kind of give up on the post and beam business and went with joists. And we just kept with rough saw and joists. So if you look to the left, 
you're going to see a full two inch joist that might be eight inches by or 10 inches high. And what we do, or what we used to do, we'll mill it down so that it's inch and a half, and you're lucky to get that these days by seven and a half inches or nine and a half inches. And what you've done is you've basically uh, turned 25% of the structural capacity of that wood in bending and in shear, and you've turned that into sawdust. That's a waste of our, of, of our forest products. Um, so we still, to this day, use rough sawn, in some cases, edge plane. Um, the uh, mills have gotten better. What happens is the log goes on a cradle. The cradle runs through a scanner. The scanner looks at the, at the geometry of the log and offers the operator some choices as to how to mill that log into the various sizes of roof of wood. And then it's run under a overhead saw that's, that cuts it along its length into different uh, thicknesses of, of wood, um, which then falls on its side and then they're cut uh, uh, to the right width later on. And they've gotten better, so they don't, uh, the rough sawn has come down a little bit, but they're still wasting an awful lot of wood it ends up being sawdust on the floor that should have been left on the stick. And just to sort of point this out to you, um, if I take a six by eight or six by 10, uh, 10 beam, main structural beam, uh, and I decide I don't wanna deal with the beam, I wanna use joist. Um, so I could take three rough sawn two by eights or two by tens and put them together um, and nail them together, which is a lot of work, by the way. And you got to match the crowns on it. In other words, you want to crown up on a floor or a roof so that when the weight comes on it, it's going to come basically level. But if you put the crown down, it already isn't level. Um, so that's kind of equivalent. But what we're doing today is the other drawing on the right down below there. We're taking how many one and a half inch two by eights or two by tens do we have to put together to get the equivalency of a six by eight rough sawn beam? And you can see that there's four of them. And you can imagine the work you have to do to nail all that stuff together and to match the crowns on all of that. And you're still shy because you've lost the height of the joists. So we should, and these days they actually penalize you uh, if you use rough sawn. Uh, you have to have an engineer stamp on it um, before you, they'll let you do it. So we have two things that we do that should be standard practice. This, these, these slab on grade replacing ground and using ground insulation techniques and using rough sawn timber for our main structural elements. And, um, and, the, and if you looked at the engineering of it, um, it should be mandatory that you actually use the rough sawn and that you actually use ground insulation techniques. It's just uh, from environmental, from a cost effective and for the use of our forestry products and our use of concrete, we really should be doing these sorts of things. So let's get back to um, and see if we can actually answer some questions or get some re response back from you folks. Thanks, Don. Um, so yeah, folks, if you have any questions that you'd like answered, you can answer them and enter them in the question and answer chat. Um, you can also, I think, raise your hand and we can and you can ask your questions live. Um, so I'll give you all a moment um, if you're interested in entering a question. I think, Don, that was great. Um, it's interesting how much of that is built off of like some pretty like fundamental building science principles. And it just, 
like it's interesting to see how it, it seems like you implemented a lot of design thinking and um and thought a lot about like the the spaces you were building and and so it's interesting and, and it's kind of you know makes me a little bit curious um about you know the the potential for for people who are um building their own homes and and how they can um be a little bit creative so um well, I also uh, I can show you some pictures of uh, of uh, one of the houses that we've done to give you a sense of how that all comes together, if you like. Okay, so I think we might have two questions coming in, Don. Um, so I think the first one is from Sean. Um, Sean, I'm gonna um, allow you to talk. So if you have a question, you can take it away, I think. but you're on mute. I wanted to thank you, Don. It, it, I, I hear you admit you didn't start strong, but it was a really great learning experience and thank you for that. I wish you luck at working out the use of the new laptop. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say was thank you for this. You did wonderful. Agreed. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Okay. So that's that's a pretty good start to question and answer period. <laughs> um, I think Anne, um, your hand is up, so you can go ahead and ask your question. I think you're off of mute. All right, you can hear me, can you? Yep, I can hear you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this, Don. I was really interested in your experiences and developing uh, more sensible and practical techniques. Um, I listened to something on YouTube or watched it quite a few years ago, and a gentleman, in order to heat his greenhouse, had put that black piping, PVC pipe, down four feet all around his backyard. He had a big backyard and used the fan in the similar manner that you were talking about the piping being inside the concrete. Have you ever come across that use of ground heat? Actually, one of the things we did with Solar Nova Scotia very early on was 101 solar projects. And one of the one was this guy that actually buried a uh, big O, which is a corrugated drainage pipe. And he ran it the length of the greenhouse from one end to the other. So we had all this pipe coming up at either end of the greenhouse and it all stuck up in the air and it looked like Medusa on a bad hair day. And then he put a plenum on them and then they pushed air through them as a way of uh, transferring the heat into the soil. What we discovered is, is you're better off with metal. Um, uh, it's a much better conductor than plastic basically. And when it's embedded in the concrete, you don't worry about it rusting or anything like that. Once it's poured in there, it's good to go. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of experimentation going on in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and God help you if you try to experiment now. There's just uh, no latitude for you to do that at all. That's right. Okay, well, thank you. That's interesting. Little tip there about the metal piping. Yeah, it's it's if it's in the concrete and uh, yeah, and because the concrete is not exposed to the ground, um, that pipe we've instrumented our buildings years after the people were in there, and we ran all of the sensor wires through the ductwork systems to get it to the sensors where we needed to, and we saw all the inside of the ductwork, and all the inside of the ductwork was clean basically. And we put it in in such a way that if you pull a register at the perimeter of the building, you can you can put a cleaner in through there. Or at the main plenum, there's a big hatch where you can see every one of the ducts. So all the ductwork in the slag can be cleaned from either direction, from the register or from the plenum in the middle of the building. Nice, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. I think we actually have a question from another Anne, Anne with an E. <laughs> um, I'll ask you to unmute. Um, uh, 
uh, and Guy, and I think you're unmuted, so you can ask your question. Mine is just a comment. I was thinking today, it's earlier today or yesterday, just uh, um, so many new things, like the kind of things that Dawn was talking about that could be done to make buildings better. And I was thinking, you know, I would love to do that, but I would only ever do that if I could find a contractor who, you know, knew all this stuff. So thank you, Dawn. It's good to know there is a contractor. There is somebody who knows all these things. I'm not going to build yet. I may never build, but I just bought a house last year. So uh, it's good to know. And I will keep your name or anybody else you can recommend. That's it for me. All right. Thanks, Anne. Um, I think we have another question that came in the chat um, from Elizabeth. Um, she asked, how many contractors in Nova Scotia are familiar with the techniques Don talks about? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the early days, uh, when we were doing greenhouses, we came up with the greenhouse manual. This, uh, I'm one of the founding members of Solar Nova Scotia Society. And the greenhouse manual and the greenhouse course uh, became the maritime solar shelter manual and the solar shelter courses. And the maritime solar shelter manual became the Canadian solar home design manual, which we wrote. Um, Shauna Henderson and Jeff Ward and myself and Gordo Wilkie um, and uh, Mike Little, all of us worked together to create these manuals. We have a couple manuals left uh, and there is no economics to reproducing them uh, as, a, as a printed book. So we're gonna get together as soon as Shauna recovers from her deep COVID. Um, fog, um, and we'll uh, we're going to turn it into an ebook. I'm and in answer to your question, I'm also involved with the Home Designers Association, and uh, my role there is to make sure that the students in architectural and engineering technology, um, which I gave a workshop last week to a two-hour workshop on design to. I make sure that the designers and the students in that curriculum know their solar. Um, so, um, but contractors are very, very uh, slow to adapt something new. And when I do have contractors who take the one day passive solar construction course, which is 60 bucks, and you get all the detailing on a DVD, et cetera, et cetera. And it's for designers and builders. I always ask the builders whether they think they can do it. And without fail, they all say, this is easier than what we normally do, right? But the problem is you got to hire an engineer to do it. And uh, that's another bureaucrat that most builders don't want to have to deal with. Um, and. Uh, and unfortunately for me, my, I had a, an engineer who appreciated my engineering background and what we were doing, and he didn't charge me a whole lot. And he was very familiar with our crew, et cetera, et cetera, like um, how skilled they, they are. For instance, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't use nailing guns, we use hammers, uh, and we use galvanized Dardox nails. When we nail something together, it is not coming apart. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and now that I have a retired engineer, um, it's going to cost me four times more to hire another engineer to oversee my buildings. So that's a major disincentive, and that that was the reason why I tried to get the province to adopt a single slab detail that would work throughout the whole province, because you know. Everybody should be doing this. And we don't want to have an engineer. And the engineering risk to the slab is less than the engineering risk to a footing and a, and a concrete wall. So you just sit there, it's just, 
boggles my mind that uh, that we're, we're not able to adapt to allow these new techniques to come into play. Thanks, Don. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. If you do have any, feel free to put your hand up or um, type it in and we'll, and we'll let you speak or we'll answer your question. Um, but this has been great, Don. I think that um, there's a lot of interest in, in, in your area of work. And I think I'm speaking for all the attendees when I say we really appreciate having you here. Um, well, as, as a parting shot, I'd love to show you a picture of one of the houses that I'd done. Um, um, oh, two years ago, a house we did in 1980. Um, and the, the client called me and said, look, um, we love this house. We want to stay here, but we have health issues. Um, and in 1988, we actually put a, a big greenhouse on their house where we made every mistake in the book, where we learned all these lessons. And so we went in with the crew and we buried the old greenhouse, extended the living room out over it created a wheelchairable entry. We bought the driveway down, so it was wheelchairable. There was a powder room on that floor, so we poured a shower stall into the slab, and that's what's neat about a slab. The whole bathroom runs to a drain, and it's all wheelchairable. And we put a wheelchairable bedroom on their house, and now they're happy to stay in their home. And uh, the pictures I was gonna show you is for a house that in the spring, uh, no, in the late late spring or early summer, we're going in to put a wheelchair addition on that house also. So um, let's see if we can figure out how to get back to. Um, yeah, you take your time. I think um, there's a couple of resources being shared in the chat, a couple of links that people can visit. Um, just for information sharing, I know Sean has something from Impact Canada. Um, folks can visit. I haven't clicked on the link myself, so I don't know the details, but. Uh, yeah, okay. There's... Yeah. So um, if you're seeing this, I, I can now show you some pictures. Are we seeing? We are seeing. Pictures of a house. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So this is kind of typical. Most of our houses would be vertical siding, but this case it's not. Um, and you can see the two foot knee walls. Um, so there's no frost line here. In fact, this thing is almost sitting all on bedrock. Um, and that's the interior of this place. And you can see when you when you do slab on grade, you can do some really neat things between outside and inside. In fact, uh, some of the houses will put a little recess in the slab and we'll have rocks and plants set into the slab inside um, and decking recessed into the slab inside. So the decking runs from inside the house through the glass to outside and the rocks and the plants run from inside the house to outside and we blur the connection between inside and outside the house. Um, um, and you can see the rough sawn beams. That we used back then and are still using it. Yeah. So. It's gorgeous. We have fun. <laughs> I have to tell you that. Um, the problem now is, this is my Newfoundland rant. Um, what we have today is we have young people borrowing their parents' money through the banks where the CEOs are making a minimum of $10 million a year. They're buying my suppliers, the people with the, with the uh, resources. In some cases, they invest in the company. In most cases, they don't. They just up the price, pocket the money, and look for something else to buy. Um, um, 
Yeah, and we wonder why young people can't afford to design and build a home anymore. And so as of a year and a half ago, I had to let my crew go because I have no ambition to design palaces, just not interested in doing OSB boxes. And just to push the push it a little bit further, my foreman, who's a superb, he can do anything in wood, he's a wooden boat builder, he can do anything um, with metal. Um, and he, and he and, and Wade have been with me for 35 years. Um, and they're both let go. Um, because the average person can no longer afford to design and build a home. So Ian eventually ended up working for a regular contractor and he was happy when he was doing staircases because they left him alone. And he's the kind of guy at the end of the day and say, look what I done, you see that? Anyway, um, they eventually stuck him in with the regular crew with the nailing guns, building rectangular OSB boxes. And he's saying, what the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here doing this. So he quit. And he went to get his pay. And this tops it all off, I gotta tell you. Never guess what the builder said to him. He said, he didn't say what great work you did on those staircases. What he said was, oh, I think I made a few dollars on you. And that tells you everything. And he's lucky, he is so lucky because he doesn't know how close he came to being floored because that's an insult to somebody like that. Mm -hmm. But that's what it's about now. It's pretty hard, as much as, as we would like to get the cost down, it's pretty hard to convince a contractor who's making $50,000 on a home or $100,000 on a home not to make that $50,000 or $100,000 on a home. And it's all about how fast you can get it up and how quickly. You and right now, um, I won't even think of building anything in HRM. You couldn't keep a schedule. You couldn't find subcontractors to do your electrical, your plumbing or whatnot. You, there's no way you can keep a schedule. Talk to a normal contractor and they'll tell you what used to take them four months. Now they're lucky they can get it done in a year and a half. So here we are, we've got young people can no longer afford to even think of designing and building a home. And we've got a situation where, uh, you know, the average person can't even afford a home. Not, not a good situation. Not a good situation at all. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, and uh, I'm, if it's in rural areas, um, um, you can get subs and uh, and if it's anywhere within an uh, hour's drive of Hubbard's, um, we might be looking at it. Well said, and um, definitely sparking some questions in the chat. Um, just wanna make sure I'm getting to all of them, but... Um, from Joanna, she she commented, she said, I'm fascinated, but also wondering what laws there are that say new rental buildings have to have solar or and heat pumps. Where do I go to get that info? Um, I don't know if you... It's um, for passive solar, it's all about orientation. So it's all, you, you work with the, the lot that you have and, uh, and if the views are due north, that's, uh, uh, and that's why we have, uh, by the way, folks, we have the passive solar videos on EAC's website. So if you go to um, the videos, uh, you will eventually get to the passive solar videos. And I would look at the introduction and I would go to the construction module, which will go through what I just went through with you. 
And if you want to get into the science and the particulars of it, uh, you can go through the, the passive solar component, capture, distribute, and store the heat. It gets quite scientifically oriented. Um, also, there is a site planning component to that, which every year, the home designers, we take the students out on a site planning weekend, which they love. And so we run that component, the site planning component with them, and we take them out, show them how to use an eye level, measure slopes, and find the solar orientation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, they, and on Saturday, we do that. And on Sunday, they're given a profile of a client and one of the sites that they've analyzed, and they have to design the site and design a concept of a home for that site. And then they have to present it. So it's a wonderful weekend. The students just love it. <laughs> um, and I hope that they get to actually do it in real life. If things change, but they've got a chance. But if they don't change, I'm not optimistic about it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so there and uh, the home designers, we're rebuilding our website right now. Um, and we will um, have the videos available on that website uh, when it is completed, hopefully in a couple months. Great, and just to clarify, that's you can find Don's videos through EAC there on our YouTube channel and you go to videos, I think, and, and you'll come, they'll, they'll pop up there and I, they might also be on the website. Um, yeah, I found it through the website. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. so either or, should work. Yeah. Yeah, and um, lots of, you're getting lots of love in the chat, Don. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, this, uh, yeah, we're getting lots of love. Someone uh, you built a house for in 1991, so they still love and appreciate it. It's from Lil. And um, another comment from Anne about just keep telling people like us about the innovation and help you gave the good guys over the, the years of your career. And you're helping a lot of home designers, et cetera, to help change things. And lots of thank yous as well. And yes, this um, will be recorded and we'll probably um, have an edited version on the website. And then <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take out your hiccups. Don't worry about it, Don. <laughs> you didn't have many anyway, so you're, you're your worst critic. Um, yeah, so I think if that's it, thank you, Don, so much. This was so interesting. Um, it's kind of one of, one of the more uh, fun talks we've had in a while. I love the design component of this and 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 seeing the the graphics that you had in your PowerPoint and everything and we're so pleased to have you and everyone and as we said earlier you can find a lot of Don's content um, on our website or on our YouTube channel um, and um, and so so thank you Don and thank you everyone for attending and uh, stay tuned for the next Better Building Speaker series that we'll have. Um, announced in, in the coming weeks. And um, we'll, we'll see you all soon and take care. So thank you very much.